Today, I want to talk a little bit about follow-up experiments. For a lot of the assignments, I've required you to come up with a follow-up experiment that you might do. The example paper that I want to talk about today is this one that involves mapping circuits and how two different inputs converge or both arrive onto primary motor cortex in the brain. This paper, as Teresa and I pointed out in the blog assignments, is primarily a proof of principle describing the use of two different colors of channerodopsin, meaning a channerodopsin variant where uh, the activation energy is redshifted relative to the normal blue light that activates traditional channerodopsin. They call the second channerodopsin with red activation rhea ch channerodopsin. Throughout the course of the paper, what they end up discovering is that in primary motor cortex, this area up here, there are inputs that arrive from both somatosensory cortex, which is the sensory area a little bit further back in the brain here, as well as a deeper structure called the thalamus, in particular a subregion of the thalamus called POM. They find that some neurons that they record from receive input only from somatosensory cortex, that is some motor cortex neurons only have somatosensory cortex input, other motor neurons only get input from the thalamus, other motor neurons don't seem to get input from either, and other motor neurons get convergent input from both. They then begin to characterize a little bit about the way these two types of inputs interact um, when they're stimulating, for example, one input followed closely by the other. And there are a variety of different quantifications that they go through, the details of which are not terribly important for us right now. In thinking about follow-up experiments for this, there are a lot of different avenues you could take. For example, one avenue would be to look at a different brain area. So perhaps you're interested in convergent inputs onto visual cortex. Maybe there are two different brain areas that might make inputs onto visual cortex, and you're curious whether the same individual cells in primary visual cortex receive input from uh, input area A as well as input area B. Another avenue you could take with this is to ask a little bit more about what's going on in motor cortex here. So we've seen, for example, that um, primary motor cortex gets these two different inputs, but we really don't have a lot to go on based on this paper about what these two different inputs are doing and what these motor cortex neurons that get that receive convergent input from these two different areas are computing. For example, maybe these motor cortex neurons that are getting input from both of these areas have a fundamentally different function in the motor cortex than neurons that receive input from just somatosensory cortex or just area POM. And so in order to test that, you might um, uh, identify and label motor cortex neurons uh, into four different subclasses. Those that receive input just from somatosensory cortex, so those that receive input just from uh, POM of the thalamus, those that receive input from both, and those that receive input from neither. And then you might record from those motor neurons in an awake animal as the animal performs some sort of motor, motor task and see whether that, uh, whether you detect differences in the function of those neurons. Another kind of follow-up experiment you could do would be to take this technique, the two different colors of channerodopsin, and apply it to a different scenario. One other paper that we've been discussing in this class is this one, uh, in which uh, they record from an individual neuron in isolated brain slices while stimulating with this caged glutamate the cell bodies of the input neurons. But you might be curious to know, not just, for example, for this cell in layer 2, 3 here, where are the cell bodies of the input neurons, but maybe you want to know where are the different excitatory or inhibitory neurons that project onto it located in terms of the location on the dendritic tree that they make synapses. So for example here, 
we've discovered already in the last uh, in the last paper that there are a lot of excitatory neurons in layer four that make synaptic contacts onto our layer two three neuron, but we don't know where on the the elaborate dendritic branching pattern of this layer 2-3 neuron, those inputs come. So if instead of using cage glutamate, we infected these layer 4 cells with channerodopsin, we could then stimulate along the dendrite and activate the presynaptic terminals from these layer 4 neurons. And wherever we see activation of our layer 4 neuron, now that tells us not where the cell body is that makes input onto our pyramidal neuron in layer 2-3, but rather where the synaptic terminal that we're directly stimulating with channerodopsin. And in fact, with this two-color channerodopsin, we could even expand this a little bit further. Maybe we put um, traditional blue excited channerodopsin into excitatory neurons and this red-shifted channerodopsin into inhibitory neurons. We then record from a single neuron in layer 2-3, and then we see perhaps that all of the excitatory inputs are made up onto the uh, apical dendrite, that is the dendrite that extends up from the cell body, and all of the inhibitory connections are made onto these basal dendrites, or the dendrites that extend down from the cell body. And then that would give us some indication not only about where the cell bodies live that are driving this neuron to fire, um, which is what we got from this paper here, but also where on our postsynaptic cell, these presynaptic inputs are made. In general, as you're considering ways to do follow-up experiments, there's not one right thing to do. One avenue that often works reasonably well is to extend and use the method proposed in the paper to answer a related question. If you feel more creative or as you have more experience with more areas of the brain, you can start to think about ways to either apply their method to a new area of the brain or apply their conclusions to a different question that you can ask in that same area. So drawing from a different method and starting to consider what we can do with it. The example I discussed a minute ago about using this technique to identify the four classes of motor neurons, the ones that get somatic sensory input, the ones that get thalamic input, the ones that get both, and the ones that get neither, and then a, using a different technique, namely identifying these neurons in a living animal as it performs a particular task, is one way that you can do this second kind of follow-up where we take the conclusions from this paper and now have a new method that we're applying. Either type of follow-up or anything else that sort of draws on the paper is a, is a great way to proceed with this. And as you get more experience, you'll become more and more comfortable building follow-up experiments.